Video Press presents Thomas and Beulah by Rita Dove. Featuring actual historical photographs. Poems recited by Rita Dove. Rita Dove received the 1987 Pulitzer Prize for her book of poems. In Thomas and Beulah, Rita Dove's ability to see the poetry in her grandparents' lives in the city and backyards of Akron, Ohio, won her the Pulitzer Prize. It is the poet who looks at the underside of a Goodyear blimp and sees the belly of a whale. It is the poet who looks at a dilapidated house and sees its sagging porch as cantilevered on faith. For the next 60 minutes, you will experience Rita Dove's ability as a poet to paint with words a picture that describes the lives and emotions of her grandparents from the turn of the century to 1969. Thomas and Beulah is divided into two sections, each with a title. The first section is called Mandolin and picks up Thomas's story from the moment he inherits a mandolin from his friend Lem. Like a mandolin, Thomas's life reverberates with double meanings, sensual and lively, gleeful and melancholy at the same time. Since the mandolin actually belonged to Thomas's friend, however, Thomas carries music through his life in the same way as he carries Lem's memory. The Event Thomas and Beulah began with a story my grandmother told me about my grandfather's life on a Mississippi River boat as part of a song and dance team. One evening Thomas challenged his partner to swim over to an island, but it was one of those treacherous pseudo-islands which are actually no more than a tangle of roots and mangrove. Before his very eyes the island sunk with his friend on it. I could not reconcile my image of my grandfather, who I remembered as a shy, domesticated man, with this story. And so I started writing to find out who my grandfather really was. In the process, I explored my grandmother's life too, as well as the world they lived in. That's how the book was born and how it grew as I recreated their stories. Ever since they'd left the Tennessee Ridge with nothing to boast of but good looks and a mandolin, the two Negroes leaning on the rail of a riverboat were inseparable. Lem plucked to Thomas's silver falsetto. But the night was hot and they were drunk. They spat where the wheel churned mud and moonlight they called to the tarantulas down among the bananas to come out and dance. You're so fine and mighty, let's see what you can do, said Thomas, pointing to a tree-capped island. Lem stripped, spoke easy, them's chestnuts, I believe, dove quick as a gasp. Thomas, dry on deck, saw the green crown shake as the island slipped under, dissolved in the thickening stream. At his feet, a stinking circle of rags, the half-shell mandolin. Where the wheel turned, the water gently shirred. Variation on pain. At the end of the event, the only things left of Lem are his clothes and the mandolin. When Thomas picks up that mandolin, he picks up the burden of guilt, and then he teaches himself to play. Finally, he attains some relief from the past by performing a sacrifice on himself. He pierces his ears, a symbolic wounding, a way of saying he's no longer innocent. Two strings, one pierced cry. So many ways to imitate the ringing in his ears. He lay on the bunk, mandolin in his arms. 
two strings for each note and seventeen frets, ridged sound humming beneath calloused fingertips. There was a needle in his head, but nothing fit through it. Sound quivered like a rope stretched clear to land, tensed and brimming, a man gurgling air. Two greased strings for each pierced lobe. So is the past forgiven. Jiving. Thomas ends up in Ohio playing the mandolin, which was often called a potato bug or tater bug because the mandolin's belly was striped like a potato bug's. Heading north, straw hat cocked on the back of his head, tight curls gleaming with brilliantine. He didn't stop until the nights of Chaw and River Bright had retreated somehow into another's life. He landed in Akron, Ohio, 1921, on the dingy beach of a man-made lake. Since what he'd been through, he was always jiving, gold hoop from the right ear jiggling, and a glass stud, bright blue, in his left. The young ladies saying, he sure plays that tater bug like the devil, sighing their sighs and dimpling. Straw Hat. In the 1920s, during what is known as the Great Migration, thousands of men from the rural south came north, pouring into the towns along the Great Lakes because there was work in the still mills and the rubber factories and the automobile assembly lines. Akron was a boom town. Thomas hired on at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, which had acquired so many workers there was no time to build housing for them. Goodyear kept the factories going 24 hours a day and built barracks for the workers, assigning three men to a bed, which meant you had eight hours to sleep, eight hours to work in the factories, and eight hours to hang around. So the beds were always occupied. In the city, under the sawtoothed leaves of an oak overlooking the tracks, he sits out the last minutes before dawn, lucky to sleep third shift. Years before he was anything, he lay on so many kinds of grass, under stars, the moon's bald eye opposing. He used to sleep like a glass of water held up in the hand of a very young girl. Then he learned he wasn't perfect, that no one was perfect. So he made his way north under the bland roof of a tent too small for even his lean body. The mattress ticking he shares in the work barracks is brown and smells from the sweat of two other men. One of them chews snuff. He's never met either. To him, work is a narrow grief and the music afterwards is like a woman reaching into his chest to spread it around. When he sings, he closes his eyes. He never knows when she'll be coming, but when she leaves, he always tips his hat. Courtship. Thomas courts Beulah by playing his mandolin as they promenade the block. She's a very proper young lady. She will not get into his car. And before he knows it, he has given her his yellow scarf and ends up in her parents' parlor asking Beulah's half-Cherokee father for her hand. Fine evening. May I have the pleasure? Up and down the block, waiting for what? A magnolia breeze? Someone to trot out the stars? But she won't set a foot in his turtle dove Nash. It wasn't proper. 
Her pleated skirt fans softly a circlet of arrows. King of the crawfish in his yellow scarf, mandolin belly pressed tight to his hound's tooth vest, his wrist flicks for the pleats all in a row, sighing. So he wraps the yellow silk still warm from his throat around her shoulders. He made good money. He could buy another. A gnat flies in his eye, and she thinks he's crying. Then the parlor festooned like a ship, and Thomas twirling his hat in his hands, wondering, how did I get here? China pugs guarding a fringed settee where a father, half Cherokee, smokes and frowns. I'll give her a good life. What was he doing, selling all for a song? His heart fluttering shut, then slowly opening. Nothing Down. Nothing Down is an intricate poem that alternates between two voices. Thomas is about to buy a car and has graciously allowed Beulah to pick the color. The year is 1928, right before the stock market crash. While Beulah tries to guess which color Thomas would want, she realizes this is a test. Thomas imagines how impressed all his friends in his hometown will be. But the darker memories from Tennessee fight their way to the surface, especially the evening when he and Lem had to to escape a white mob looking to lynch the first black man they met. Thomas's thoughts jump back and forth between the business of buying a car and the horrible memory. Beulah makes her decision. Thomas buys the car on credit, and they head for Tennessee. But a racist encounter on the highway reinforces Thomas's nightmare memory of that lynching. He lets her pick the color. She saunters along the gleaming fenders, trying to guess his mind. The flower dangled blue flame above his head. He had stumbled into the woods and found this silent forgiveness. How they'd all talk, Punkin and Babe, Willemma tis tisking in her sinking cabin. A child's forest, moss and threads gone wild with hope. The boys down by the creek, grown now, straddling the rail at the general store. Lem smiled from a tree and nodded when Thomas told him he was a few years early. We'll run away together, was all Lem said. She bends over, admiring her reflection in the headlamp casing of a peerless. On an ordinary day, he would have plucked this blue trumpet of heaven and rushed it home to water. Nigger red, she drawls, moving on. Catching a woman, Lem used to say, is like rubbing two pieces of silk together. Done right, the sheen jags and the grit shines through. A sky blue Chandler. She pauses, feeling his gaze. Every male on the ridge old enough to whistle was either in the woods or under a porch. He could hear the dogs rippling up the hill. Eight miles outside Murfreesboro, the burn of stripped rubber, soft mud of a ditch. A carload of white men halloo past them on Route 231. You and your south, she shouts above the radiator hiss. Don't tell me this ain't what you were hoping for. The air was being torn into hopeless pieces. Only this flower hovering above his head couldn't hear the screaming. 
That is why the petals had grown so final. The Zeppelin factory. Goodyear also built blimps, and the airship hangar erected in 1929 was the largest building in the world without interior supports. Thomas gets a new job at the air dock. Like Jonah in the belly of the whale, he feels diminished as he crouches inside the massive struts of the blimp. When the completed blimp is finally launched, there is a spectacular accident. Three of the men holding launch lines are carried up with the blimp by a freak gust of wind. After this disaster, whenever Thomas spots a blimp, he imagines that Lem is inside, watching over him. The Zeppelin factory needed workers, all right. But standing in the cage of the whale's belly, Sparks flying off the joints and noise thundering. Thomas wanted to sit right down and cry. That spring, the third largest airship was dubbed the biggest joke in town, though they all turned out for the launch. Wind caught, the Akron floated out of control, three men in tow. One dropped to safety, one hung on, but the third, muscles and adrenaline failing, fell clawing 600 feet. Thomas sat night in the vacant lot. Here I am, intact and faint-hearted. Thomas hiding his heart with his hat at the football game, eyeing the Goodyear blimp overhead. Big boy. I know you're in there. Under the Viaduct, 1932. During the Depression, Thomas goes out every day to look for work. Since there are no jobs, he simply wanders around a little bit bitter as he reviews events caused by the Depression. Families evicted because they couldn't pay the rent. Neighbors scuffling with the police who come to force people out of their homes. But even the powerful are affected by the economy. Thomas remembers the suicide of a local bank executive who jumped off the North Hill viaduct. He avoided the empty mill yards, the households towering next to the curb. It was dark where he walked, although above him the traffic was hissing. He poked a trail in the mud with his tin-capped stick. If he had a son this time, he would teach him how to step between his family and the police, the mob bellowing as a kettle of communal soup spilled over a gray bank of clothes. The pavement wobbled, loosened by rain. He liked it down here where the luck of the mighty had tumbled, black suit and collarbone. He could smell the worms stirring in their holes. He could watch the white sheet settle while all across the North Hill viaduct tires slithered to a halt. Compendium. In a quiet moment, Thomas assesses the things he's given up, drink, his flashy clothes, and the diminished prospects of domesticity, singing in the church choir instead of on a riverboat, a wife who pays more attention to her canary than to him, the abandoned mandolin hanging on the wall with the yellow scarf. And, of course, his daughters, four possibilities, lined up in their beds. He gave up fine cordials and his houndstooth vest. He became a sweet tenor in the gospel choir, Canary 
usurper of his wife's affections. Girl, 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 girl. In the parlor with streamers, a bug on a nail, the canary courting its effigy, the girls fragrant in their beds. Aircraft. During World War II, Thomas is classified too frail for combat, so he works at aircraft building fighter planes. His co-workers are all women, and the women are assigned the all-important job of assembling engines because their smaller fingers can do delicate tasks. Thomas is enraged at being on the sidelines of the war and the war effort. Too frail for combat, he stands before an interrupted wing, playing with an idea, nothing serious. Afternoons, the hall gaped with aluminum, glaring, flying towards the sun. Now, though, first thing in the morning, there is only gray sheen and chatter from the robust women around him and the bolt waiting for his riveter's five-second blast. The night before, in the dark of the peanut gallery, he listened to blouses shifting and sniffed magnolias, white tongues of remorse sinking into the earth. Then the newsreel leapt forward into war. Why frail? Why not simply family man? Why wings when women with fingers no smaller than his dabble in the gnarled intelligence of an engine? And if he gave just a four-second blast, or three, reflection is such a bloodless light. After lunch, they would bathe in fire. The Charm. In a dream, Lem appears before Thomas and tells him why he's been haunting him all his life. From this point on, Thomas understands that he has been not cursed, but charmed, and consequently feels a duty to bear this second life with grace. They called us the Taterbug Twins. We could take a tune and chew it up, Fling it to the moon for the crows to eat. At night he saw him, naked and swollen under the backyard tree. No reason, he replied when asked why he'd done it. Thomas woke up minutes later thinking, what I need is a drink. Sunday mornings, fried fish and hominy steaming from the plates like an oracle. The canary sang more furious than ever, but he heard the whisper. I ain't dead. I just gave you my life. Roast Possum on a grandparent's knee and listen to stories whose significance doesn't hit us until years later. When Thomas tells his grandchildren how to hunt possums, he's also trying to equate the survival tactics of possums with those of black Americans. For, just as a possum will play dead when caught, hoping to be overlooked, very often black Americans have had to feign ignorance or stupidity in order to get by. But when he mentions that a famous Tennessee horse is buried under a tombstone in a town where many blacks could not afford a decent burial, his precociously militant grandson is enraged. Rather than discuss racial economic injustices, Thomas reminds them of the possum. The possum's a greasy critter that lives on persimmons and what the Bible calls carrion. 
So much from the 1909 Werner Encyclopedia, three rows of deep green along the wall. A granddaughter propped on each knee, Thomas went on with his tale. But it was for Malcolm, little red delicious, that he invented embellishments. We shine that possum with a torch, and I shinnied up, being the smallest, to shake him down. He glared at me, teeth bared like a shark's in that torpedo's snout. Man, he was tough, but no match for old-time know-how. Malcolm hung back, studying them with his gold hawk eyes. When the girls got restless, Thomas talked horses. Strolling Jim, who could balance a glass of water on his back and trot the village square without spilling a drop. Who put war trace on the map and was buried under a stone like a man. They liked that part. He could have gone on to tell them that the Werner admitted Negro children to be intelligent though briskness clouded over at puberty, bringing indirection and laziness. Instead, he added, you got to be careful with the possum when he's on the ground. He'll turn on his back and play dead till you give up looking. That's what you'd call sullen. Malcolm interrupted to ask, who owned strolling Jim? and who paid for the tombstone. They stared each other down, man to man, before Thomas, as a grandfather, replied, Yes, sir, we enjoyed that possum. We ate him real slow with sweet potatoes. Thomas at the wheel. Thomas drives to the drugstore to get his heart medicine prescription filled. But before he can get out of the car, he has another stroke and dies in the front seat of the car. This then, the river he had to swim. Through the wipers, the drugstore shouted, lit up like a casino, neon script leering from the shuddering asphalt. Then the glass doors flew apart and a man walked out to the curb to light a cigarette. Thomas thought the sky was emptying itself as fast as his chest was filling with water. Should he honk? What a joke. He couldn't ungrip the steering wheel. The man looked him calmly in the eye and tossed the match away. And now the street dark, not a soul nor its brother. He lay down across the seat, a pod set to see, a kiss unpuckering. He watched the slit eye of the glove compartment, the prescription inside, he laughed as he thought, oh, the writing on the water. Thomas imagined his wife as she awoke, missing him, cracking a window. He heard sirens rise as the keys swung, ticking. The second section relates Beulah's life and is called Canary in Bloom. The color yellow is Beulah's motif. She has a yellow scarf and canaries. Yellow is a spot of brightness, a piece of gold in her hard life. Beulah is like a bird in a gilded cage. She sings behind bars of domesticity. Taking in Wash Beulah is a dark child, although her father is half Cherokee and changes skin color according to the seasonal sun. Her mother, 
who is dark like Beulah, supports them by doing white families laundry while her father, who cannot find a job, comes home drunk one night and vents his rage against the freshly ironed laundry. Papa called her Pearl when he came home drunk, swaying as if the wind touched only him. Towards winter, his skin paled, buckeye to ginger root, cold drawing the yellow out. The Cherokee in him, Mama said. Mama never changed. When the dog crawled under the stove and the back gate slammed, Mama hid the laundry. Sheba barked as she barked in snow or clover, a spoiled and ornery bitch. She was Papa's girl, black though she was. Once in winter, she walked through a dream all the way down the stairs to stop at the mirror, a beast with stricken eyes who screamed the house awake. Tonight, every light hums. The kitchen is arctic with sheets. Papa is making the hankies sail. Her foot upon a silk-stitched rose, she waits until he turns, his smile sliding all over. Mama, a tight, dark fist. Touch that child, and I'll cut you down, just like the cedar of Lebanon. Magic. Magic exists in the world of a child. Beulah, for instance, is entranced when she feels no pain after scraping the outermost layer of skin on her forehead on the grindstone. Adults, however, know about shocked nerve endings. Beulah has a vision which she takes as a sign that someday she will go to Paris a city she associates with all things beautiful and free and magical. The tragedy is that she never does make it to Paris, although she devises ways of compensating. Practice makes perfect, the old folks said. So she rehearsed deception until ice cubes dangled willingly from a plain white string and she could change an egg into her last nickel. Sent to the yard to sharpen, she bent so long over the wheel the knives grew thin. When she stood up, her brow shorn clean as a wheat field and stippled with blood, she felt nothing even when Mama screamed. She fed sauerkraut to the apple tree the apples bloomed tartar every year. Like all art, useless and beautiful, like sailing in air, things happened to her. One night she awoke, and on the lawn blazed a scaffolding strung in lights. Next morning, the Sunday paper showed the Eiffel Tower soaring through clouds. It was a sign she would make it to Paris someday. Courtship Diligence Beulah's version of their courtship is slightly different than Thomas's. She longs for genteel music and fine perfume, but as a black woman in North America, she will have to settle for a mandolin and a scarf, not as elegant but compelling enough. A yellow scarf runs through his fingers as if it were melting. Thomas dabbing his brow. And now his mandolin in a hurry, though the night, as they say, is young, though she is getting on. Hush, the strings tinkle. Pretty gal. Cigar box music. She'd much prefer a pianola and scent in a sky-colored flask. Not that scarf, 
bright as butter, not his hands cool as dimes. Promises. The moment at the altar when a bride is given away by her father like so much property, the interchange presided over by God, the ultimate father. This is a mind-boggling transaction, an existential moment of exchange. Each hurt swallowed is a stone. Last words whispered to his daughter as he placed her fingertips lightly into the palm of her groom. She smiled upwards to Jesus, then Thomas, turning her back as politely as possible. He was a mountain of shame. Poised on the stone steps of the church, she tried to forget his hulk in the vestibule, clumsy in blue serge, his fingers worrying the lucky bead in his pocket. Beneath the airborne bouquet was a meadow of virgins urging, be water, be light. A deep breath, and she plunged through sunbeams and kisses, rice drumming the both of them blind. Dusting. Dusting the furniture is a moment of contemplation for Beulah. She chafes under the routine and monotony of poverty and marriage. And while dusting, she tries to recall the name of a boy who kissed her once at a carnival. Names are important. The name Beulah means both promise and desert, apt designations for the two phases of her life, before marriage and after. Finally, Beulah remembers the name of the boy. Every day a wilderness, no shade in sight. Beulah patient among knickknacks, the solarium a rage of light, a grain storm as her gray cloth brings dark wood to life. Under her hand scrolls and crests gleam darker still. What was his name, that silly boy at the fair with the rifle booth? And his kiss, and the clear bowl with one bright fish, rippling wound. Not Michael, something finer. Each dust stroke a deep breath, and the canary in bloom. Wavery memory, Home from a dance, the front door blown open and the parlor in snow. She rushed the bowl to the stove, watched as the locket of ice dissolved and he swam free. That was years before father gave her up with her name. Years before her name grew to mean promise, then desert and peace long before the shadow and son's accomplice, the tree, Maurice. Weathering out. Beulah is pregnant with their second child during the early years of the Depression. Thomas, who goes out every day in the vain hope of work, hopes this time it will be a boy, but we know better. She liked mornings the best. Thomas gone to look for work, her coffee flushed with milk, outside autumn trees lousy and dripping. Past the seventh month, she couldn't see her feet, so she floated from room to room, house shoes flapping, navigating corners in wonder. When she leaned against the door jam to yawn, she disappeared entirely. Last week they had taken a bus at dawn to the new air dock. 
The hangar slid open in segments, and the Zeppelin nosed forward in its silver envelope. The man walked it out gingerly, like a poodle, then tied it to a mast and went back inside. Beulah felt just that large and placid, a lake. She glistened from cocoa butter, smoothed in when Thomas returned every evening, nearly in tears. He'd lean an ear on her belly and say, little fellows really talking, though to her it was more the pock, pock, pock of a fingernail tapping a thick cream lampshade. Sometimes, during the night, she woke and found him asleep there, and the child sleeping, too. The coffee was good, but too little. Outside, everything shivered in tinfoil. Only the clover between the cobblestones hung stubbornly on, green as an afterthought. Motherhood. Every young mother is afraid of mishandling a newborn baby. Beulah's fears gradually transform until she comes to terms with her nightmares and discovers strength in her maternal instinct. She dreams the baby's so small she keeps misplacing it. It rolls from the hutch and the mouse carries it home it disappears with his shirt in the wash. Then she drops it and it explodes like a watermelon, eyes spitting. Finally they get to the countryside. Thomas has it in a sling. He's strewing rice along the road while the trees chitter with tiny birds. In the meadow to their right, three men are playing rough with a white wolf. She calls, warning, but the wolf breaks free, and she runs, the rattle rolls into the gully, then she's there and tossing the baby behind her, listening for its cry as she straddles the wolf and circles its throat, counting until her thumbs push through to the earth. White fur seeps red. She is hardly breathing. The small, wild eyes go opaque with confusion and shame, like a child's. Daystar. Any parent who has exclusive care of their children has moments when they need to be alone, when they wish desperately that the children would just disappear for a few minutes. Beulah often sits out behind the garage to make sure she'll be undisturbed. She wanted a little room for thinking, but she saw diapers steaming on the line, a doll slumped behind the door. So she lugged a chair behind the garage to sit out the children's naps. Sometimes, there were things to watch. The pinched armor of a vanished cricket, a floating maple leaf. Other days, she stared until she was assured when she closed her eyes, she'd see only her own vivid blood. She had an hour, at best, before Liza appeared pouting from the top of the stairs. And just what was mother doing out back with the field mice? Why, building a palace. Later that night, when Thomas rolled over and lurched into her, she would open her eyes and think of the place that was hers for an hour, where she was nothing, pure nothing, in the middle of the day. The Great Palaces of Versailles. The year Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall appear in their first film together, Beulah goes to work in a dress shop 
in order to help out with the family finances. Assigned to the back room while the white girls sell dresses out front, Beulah assuages her anger by remembering some of the habits she had read about the French court at Versailles, where the women did not wear panties and so could relieve themselves where they stood. It gratifies Beulah to recall these barbaric habits. Nothing nastier than a white person. She mutters as she irons alterations in the back room of Charlotte's dress shop. The steam rising from a cranberry wool comes alive with perspiration and stale evening of Paris. Swamp she born from, swamp she swallow, swamp she got to sink again. The iron shoves gently into a gusset, waits until the puckers bloom away. Beyond the curtain, the white girls are all wearing shoulder pads to make their faces delicate. That laugh would be Autumn, tossing her hair in imitation of Bacall. Beulah had read in the library how French ladies at court would tuck their fans in a sleeve and walk in the gardens for air. Swaying among lilies, lifting shy layers of silk, they dropped excrement as daintily as handkerchiefs. Against all rules, she had saved the lining from a botched coat to face last year's gray skirt. She knows whenever she lifts the knee, she flashes crimson. That seems legitimate. But in the book she had read how the cavalier amused themselves wearing powder and perfume and spraying yellow borders knee high on the stucco of the orangerie. A hanger clatters in the front of the shop. Eula remembers how even Autumn could lean into a settee with her ankles crossed, sighing, I need a man who'll protect me, while smoking her cigarette down to the very end. Pomade. Beulah's life is so circumscribed by domestic activity, the only way she can escape is to travel in her mind. While sweeping the floor, she recalls their trip to Tennessee in the new blue car. Thomas's sister, Willemma, who lived in a leaning cab through the power of imagination. Although she never left the homestead, Willemma stayed connected to the land. She never left her backyard, yet learned more than some people can by traveling all over the world. Wisdom comes not only from experience, but from observation. She sweeps the kitchen floor of the riverbed her husband saw fit to bring home with his catfish, recalling a flower, very straight, with a spiked collar arching under a crown of bright, fluffy worms. She had gathered in armfuls along a still road in Tennessee. Even then, he was forever off in the woods somewhere in search of a magic creek. It was Willemma shushed the pack of dusty children and took her inside the leaning cabin with its little window in the door, the cut-out magazine cloud taped to the pane so as I'll always have shade. It was Willemma showed her how to rub the petals fine and heat them slow in mineral oil until the skillet exhaled pears and nuts and rotting fur. That cabin leaned straight away to the south, took the very slant of heaven through the crabgrass and Queen Anne's lace to the colored cemetery down in Wartrace. Barley soup yearned toward the bowl's edge. The cornbread hot from the oven climbed in glory to the very black lip of the cast iron pan. 
But Willemma stood straight as the day she walked five miles to town for scotch tape and back again. Gaslight flickered on the cockeyed surface of rainwater in a galvanized pail in the corner, while Thomas pleaded with his sister to get out while she still was fit. Bee balm. The fragrance always put her in mind of Turkish minarets against the sky wrenched blue, sweet and merciless. Willemma could wear her gray hair twisted in two knots at the temples and still smell like travel. But all those years she didn't budge. She simply turned one day from slicing a turnip into a pot when her chest opened and the inrushing air knocked her down. Call the reverend, I'm in the floor, she called out to a passerby. Beulah gazes through the pale speckled linoleum to the webbed loam with its salt and worms. She smooths her hair, then sniffs her palms. On the countertop, the catfish grins like an oriental gentleman. Nothing ever stops. She feels herself rolling slowly down the sides of the earth. Sunday greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, collards, poor people's food. The greens have to cook all day long in order to be tender, with a ham hock thrown in for flavor. Beulah is struck by a memory of her mother going through the same motions over the stove. She wants to hear wine pouring. She wants to taste change. She wants pride to roar through the kitchen till it shines like straw. She wants lean to replace tradition. Ham knocks in the pot, nothing but bones, each with its bracelet of flesh. The house stinks like a zoo in summer, while upstairs her man sleeps on. Robe slung over her arm and the cradled hymnal. She pauses, remembers her mother in a slip, lost in blues, and those collards, wild-eared, singing. Company. Company is Beulah's love poem to Thomas. Though he is dead, it is a sonnet addressed to him, full of all the things she didn't say when he was alive. She tells him that they had been happy, even though they had never talked about it. Now, of course, it's too late. He cannot hear her. No one can help him anymore. Not the young thing next door in the red pedal pushers, not the canary he drove distracted with his mandolin. There'll be no more trees to wake him in moonlight, nor a single dry spring morning when the fish are lonely for company. She's standing there telling him, give it up. She's weary of sirens and his face worn with salt. If this is code, she tells him, Listen, we were good, though we never believed it. And now he can't even touch her feet. The Oriental Ballerina In her last years, Beulah contracts glaucoma, a disease which, if left untreated, will lead to tunnel vision and eventual blindness. Beulah, however, refuses to use her eye drops. Instead, she takes to her bed and waits for God to heal her. The Oriental Ballerina is Beulah's final poem. As the sun gradually shines in on the worn furnishings of the sick room, 
As the oriental dancer twirls on the jewelry box, Beulah realizes that this is the end. There will be nothing else for her but this bed, no Paris nor perfume. The sunlight finally reaches the wallpaper, whose flowers to Beulah's weak eyes glow like tutus. The oriental ballerina twirls on the tips of a carnation while the radio scratches out a morning hymn. Daylight has not ventured as far as the windows. The walls are still dark, shadowed with the ghosts of oversized gardenias. The ballerina pirouettes to the wheeze of the old rugged cross. She lifts her shoulders past the edge of the jewel box lid. Two pink slippers touch the ragged petals. No one should have feet that small. In China, they do everything upside down. This ballerina has not risen, but drilled a tunnel straight to America, where the bedrooms of the poor are papered in vulgar flowers on a background the color of grease, of tea bags, of cracked imitation walnut veneer. On the other side of the world, they are shedding robes sprigged with roses, roses drifting with a hiss to the floor by the bed, as here, the sun finally strikes the windows suddenly opaque, non-committal as shields. In this room is a bed where the sun has gone walking where a straw nods over the lip of its glass and a hand reaches for a tissue, crumpling it to a flower. The ballerina has been drilling all night. She flaunts her skirts like sails, whirling in a disc so bright, so rapidly she is standing still. The sun walks the bed to the pillow and pauses for breath. In the Orient, breath floats like mist in the fields. Hesitating at a knotted handkerchief that has slid on its string and has lodged beneath the right ear which discerns the most fragile music where there is none. The ballerina dances at the end of a tunnel of light. She spins on her impossible toes. The rest is shadow. The head on the pillow sees nothing else, though it feels the sun warming its cheeks. There is no china, no cross, just the papery kiss of a Kleenex above the stink of camphor, the walls exploding with shabby tutus. Although the ending seems bleak, I think that Thomas and Beulah were both very strong and sensitive people who lived heroic lives. Despite adversity, there were moments of joy. As Beulah says, we were good, though we never believed it. <laughs>